Welcome, everyone. My name is Sarah Carr, and I am. Oh my gosh, can you see my slide? Okay. Hey, Ray, do you have this slide by any chance? Uh, not easily accessible. Um, all right, we'll try again. Let's, sorry, guys. Uh, Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. We're working out some kinks. So um, welcome to today's webinar. Um, my name is Sarah Carr, and I'm a coordinator for the Events Network, which is co-coordinated by Octo and NatureServe. Uh, and this is also, webinar is also brought to you by Open Channels, which is a service of Octo. We are super excited to have Jorge Alvarez Romero today um, to speak about learning from others, the new conservation planning database. And Jorge, if you want to just bring up your first slide. Um, Jorge is coming to us from uh, James Cook University and the ARC Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. Um, and we will go ahead and turn it over to you whenever you're ready, Jorge. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, well, actually, uh, let me remind everyone um, how to ask questions. So uh, we're going to have an initial presentation by Jorge, and then we will um, have a Q&A session. We'll have some time for questions at the end. So you can go ahead and send in questions at any point during the presentation, and you can send them in either through the chat or through the question box. And so we, we look forward to being able to discuss uh, the conservation planning database afterwards. All right, now, Jorge. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, um, th and thanks very much for inviting me to um, present here to the network and to everyone there. Um, I'm really happy to um, present this work that we've been working on for such a long time, and, and that we're really happy that it finally has come to a stage where it's, um, in, um, it has gained good traction, and, and it's in a good um, position to hopefully start um, getting more and more uses. I said um, uh, from the Coral Reef Center in James Cook University in uh, Australia, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, this new database that we launched recently um, at the center. Um, so, um, uh, it moves. If it's not forwarding, sometimes it helps to um, back out of it and then re-enter. Yeah, no, there we go. So just very briefly, um, so this is a rough outline of the things that I'm going to touch on today. So I'm going to start with a general bargain of where we're coming from. Briefly going through the goals and the main features of the, of the database. Uh, then I'm going to explain how we use this database to create what we're calling the marine proof of concept database. Uh, then go a bit quickly through some of the potential and actual applications of, of the database and finalize with the things that we're uh, starting to do now that we're thinking of doing with the, with the prototype to move the database to the next stage. And I don't think I'm gonna take um, all that long through the presentation. So, because I wanted to do two things. One, to show you the actual database, even if it's just briefly, and then probably have also enough time to have uh, questions or a discussion, because I think that's probably where a lot of the most interesting um, things could, could happen. So, um, the, where do we come from? Um, as, as we as everyone knows, and uh, as we've seen, especially along the past um, 10 years, protected areas have been widely used um, to cover accelerating the decline of biodiversity on both terrestrial and marine environments. And the map here shows the latest uh, depiction of, of where protected areas are across the globe. And obviously that doesn't include the many other uh, local smaller scale initiatives uh, that are in the form, in one form of protection um, across the globe. And these protected areas have been uh, essentially set up um, to curb the kind of biodiversity um, by preventing specific threats. So we're talking about things like the loss of habitat through vegetation clearing, um, the effects of overfishing, uh, the effects of um, 
urbanization or coastal development, right? So um, because predicted levels have been um, so popular and widely used to some mitigation for some of these states across the globe, they've been um, growing steadily in the case of terrestrial uh, protected areas. And for marine protected areas in particular, uh, their numbers and the extent has grown um, exponentially, especially over the um, past 10 years. So because protected areas are gonna become uh, more and more common across the world, and the countries are committed both naturally and internationally to um, protect more of the um, national um, areas on the world, to protect in some form, one form or another, uh, the natural environments. Um, then the, the need to look into how we are designing and how we are setting up these protected areas is, is really important. Of course, we need to recognize that um, well, while protected areas are quite varied, Conservation interventions are not only constrained to setting up protected areas, and the number also of initiatives to undertake other activities, both within and outside protected areas, like certification of, uh, of seafood or control of feral species on weeds or fire management to reduce risk to threatened systems, has also um, increased significantly over the past um, few, few years. So all these, uh, what we call spatially based conservation actions, are going to be more and more common and are gonna be more and more widespread. And countries across the world are investing a lot of time, resources and, and money into setting up this, um, these interventions. And so, Unfortunately, especially when it comes to um, protected areas, um, despite the huge advances and the many, many benefits that they have um, um, about um, across the globe, there's also a lot of examples of good design uh, of protected areas that have been placed in what we could call uh, expensive ways. So a lot of the time we have, in, um, I guess, in especially local stakeholders have potentially have incurred um, more expense than they, than they probably should have. And in the end, um, when protected areas are, and other forms of spatial conservation are not um, designed wisely, then they may not be as effective to conserve the biodiversity that they're meant to, right? And there's a lot of literature, uh, especially in the last few years with all the revisions of it's under the Convention for Biological Diversity. There's been a lot of um, exploration about how some of these protected areas are not doing their job as good as they can. And it's not only related to um, design, it's sometimes related to implementation, sometimes related to other things. But we have seen in many cases, uh, the appearance of what we call residual protected areas. So place, places where there's potentially not enough threats to um, to deserve the protection. Uh, so protected areas are not necessarily placed in the most cost-effective ways to achieve the ultimate goal, which is to conserve biodiversity. So um, this uh, in itself was a strong motivation for us to look into, uh, all right, how much protected areas have been um, explored and how much so protected areas have been designed um, in a wise way. And in this way, um, the systematic conservation plan, uh, which I'm going to refer to as SCP in several parts of the presentation, is um, it's a discipline that has been, that is now well established, it's been going on for over 30 years, and it provides a robust and a transparent approach to the spatial allocation of, of the conservation priorities, which could come in the form of protected areas or other spatially based conservation interventions. Um, in very simple terms, uh, conservation planning involves the special prioritization to place and to define the boundaries of these conservation areas, including protected areas, in a cost-effective way. So low cost, uh, but effective. And they can range from uh, identifying areas for strict protection, like marine reserves, 
to off reserve management, like uh, the implementation of feral animal control or fire management to reduce risks to threatened species, for example. And so, um, conservation planning has been, as I said, going for quite a few, e quite a few years. Uh, yet, also roughly around the last decade, there's been an exponential increase in the number of um, conservation planning applications. And planners are more and more using this approach to delineate new protected areas and general to identify which ones are the best areas that we need to protect or to better manage to achieve the biodiversity conservation that, we, that we're aiming for. And this is obviously very important because the, as, as you know, the decline in both terrestrial and marine biodiversity continues to accelerate. Um, um, unfortunately, um, for us, even though there's a lot of effort going on there and there's a lot of really interesting and good new tools and new science about how we do conservation planning in a better way so that we don't end up with costly and ineffective protected areas. Um, unfortunately, there's up to, up to now, there hasn't been a structure or a lot of way of finding information of the methods and the trends and the progress in the discipline. And this is partially due to the large number. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of, of new studies and between the gray literature and the, and the peer review literature of, in, in this discipline. And the other problem that we've identified uh, is that there is a lot of variation in the quality of some of these plans and also in the, in the detail in how, in how they document and record how plants have been um, created, um, over, 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 especially, um, especially with regards to how some of the protected areas have been established. And so because of these things, this really limits our opportunities to first to develop best practice planning principles and then to apply them or to find these best practice principles. And so all, all in all, this, this situation, the combination of protected areas not being placed in the, in, in, in the right places and the fact that we are not being able to learn fast enough and off from what's been done already, there is, we identified that there was a really strong need for a more systematic documentation of patient practice, research and practice, and, um, and then to do a critical analysis of the literature and how this is actually um, going on. So this is this is where the database comes in. Um, and so even though the database was just recently um, launched, the, the concept has been going on for years and it actually started in its first uh, primordial form probably about um, almost 10 years ago when I first joined um, the Corbett Center at James Cook Uni. And the goal from the very beginning, um, which partially was born out of um, frustration of not being able to find all the information that I wanted uh, when I first started working on, on this field, was to make, to create a global database that was first widely accessible to both scientists and non-scientists that was up to date so that whenever we were um, searching uh, this database, we would know what essentially almost the idea was to know what everyone has done before, before us and where. And the idea of having this uh, global database was to help um, people, and I'll go more into the users in a second, to help track the development of these plans. And eventually, the implementation and the impact of these uh, conservation planning applications. And in this way, we can then learn from this effort and do a better job in, in the future. It's essentially a way of, of, of um, harnessing all the knowledge and all the effort that has happened um, over the years. So key characteristics of, the, of this database when we developed was, um, well, we wanted to make sure that there was a way of uh, standardizing the reporting for conservation plans. 
Uh, so document them in, a, in the same way, um, which, also, which obviously requires going through quite a few conservation plans to see what were the key characteristics, what were the most important, what were the things that every, every single plan um, generally included. And then the, the intention of this was to increase the, the transparency, the consistency, and the comparability of information. And in the same way, through this, through this um, in, increase in transparency, consistency, and comparability, we would, have been, we would be able to repeat the methods and to identify the reason, the rationale of the different planning decisions. Uh, and because the context of planning changes a lot what conservation plans look like and how they are um, undertaken, then it is important to have some way of comparing and, and consistently documenting um, plans across the globe. That was one of the main um, motivations and, and, and part of, I guess, the spirit of the database. On, on another really important way, um, we thought that this global database was really important to contribute in exchanging the um, advice and taking that advice. And eventually develop and share also these best practices that I've been talking about. The tools that people have been using and overall the lessons learned among researchers, practitioners, and policy makers. And so, because the task was, as you could imagine, because we're talking about thousands of um, publications, we thought that we would get started with a marine proof of concept. And we wanted to make this, at least to make sure that this was a, a comprehensive repository for systematic conservation planning exercises across the globe. And we started with all the plants in the peer-reviewed literature, of which many are actually related to actual on-ground. Um, not all of them, because some of them are theoretical, but they, they essentially they represent a significant um, amount of effort, and they certainly reflect the diversity in approaches in conservation planning, in this case, in the marine environment. Um, that being said, even though the database has, was developed, this proof of concept was developed using the marine uh, planning literature, the database was also developed to be easily adaptable to include terrestrial and freshwater conservation planning. So it really would require minor adjustments to make sure to include these additional. So, um, so we believe that the, this database is going to help us advance here in practice. Uh, as I said, providing a centralized repository of information that can help practitioners like the NGOs, uh, governments, even donors, obviously researchers, but maybe also businesses and other uses that we may not think about at the moment. And how do we think that this database can help people in the theory and the practice of conservation planning? Well, first of all, and, 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 and foremost, we need to know what being the geographic coverage. We need to identify which areas, um, both locally and globally, have re required further work because there hasn't been um, work. And by topical areas in this case, I refer to things like maybe, maybe there hasn't been enough um, looked into some of the socioeconomic factors um, design of protected areas. Maybe we've uh, emphasized too much on the, on the ecological aspects of it. Um, by looking into, into the plants, we can also directly bin or build on the, on the work of others, especially if it is within our own planning region. We can also learn from uh, plants that have been undertaken in a similar biophysical or socioeconomic context. So essentially, use others as an example to, to create our own plants. Um, especially as researchers and conservation practitioners, looking at the trends in the methods and applications is quite important, especially to see what new research is really needed, um, because we have also seen a fair bit of, not necessarily um, bad, but a bit of repetition in some of the um, studies that have been undertaken. And so, if people are more aware of what has actually been done in, you know, both in the gray and the peer-reviewed literature, then we will be able to advance more quickly in the areas that are in most need. So 
essentially the, the research gaps. Um, in a more pragmatic uh, way, um, one case is well established, and people are documenting both the planning and implementation, and or even the impacts of, of these planning processes. And we'll be able to match and compare how the initial designs, based on the initial change along with the implementation of actions and whether that has resulted in the expected benefits in biodiversity, which is essentially what we're doing conservation planning, right? Um, so obviously this is an, an, a major um, and probably more long-term goal of the database. Um, and then by identifying past and ongoing planning efforts, um, in some cases, including the data that's for the data plan, and it can help people design new protected areas in those regions. And as I said before, not only protected areas, but other spatially based interventions. And last but not least, uh, when you um, assemble um, a significant amount of um, plans, then you at the same time are um, assembling information about experts. And in and so on many occasions, we've uh, been approached, for example, by both or even governments um, to help them with their plans. And even though it sounds pretty simple, and these days with, um, with the um, internet, the, we can find anything in a few clicks, not, not everyone reaches to the relevant expertise. So finding people that are working in the right regions with the right approach in the right, um, it's also another potential um, way of how these database can help us um, advance uh, the theory and the practice of, of conservation planning. So roughly speaking, the, as I said, the database was designed to document any type of conservation planning process, even though it was um, tested mainly with marine um, literature. Um, the database at the moment is focused mainly on what we call the first nine stages or steps of the conservation um, planning process. This figure is based on um, the framework um, provided by Bob Presi and Madeline Botrill. And so the database includes, as you can see, information that goes from up to the scoping of the planning process down to the selection of, um, of additional conservation areas, in this case, in the form of, for example, protected areas, right? So it goes through a lot of, a lot of the stages that are critical to the design part of the, protect, the, of the conservation interventions. And it doesn't mean that we're not, we don't care about 10 and 11. We really care a lot about those two points, but given our initial focus to make it manageable for the design was to uh, create a comprehensive data set for the marine peer review literature. The last two points were not possible to explore in as much detail. Yet we've got some advances in, in, in the database, in the design for those, those sections. So at the moment, the our marine prototype includes around 115 fields and includes information uh, that cover those aspects of the, those steps of the planning process that goes from plan, planning goals and objectives, open the location of, of the planning exercise. What type of features uh, will target, whether, whether the regions, whether species, what type of species, whether habitat types, whether oceanographic processes, whether uh, socioeconomic features of interest. So what type of things were people thinking about when they were designing these, um, these plants? And it's got a strong section, a big section about methods and tools. So what are the approaches that people use to create these plants? And for example, one specific section talks about the planning units used to analyze and compare the options and to, and to do the procession analysis. And these are um, really important um, aspects because a lot of people make these decisions without knowing why, why you would use one, for example, type of planning unit or, or another one, one size or another or one shape or another one. 
And so documenting what people have done in the past and why they have done it is pretty, is pretty important. Um, we document information about what type of threats people were looking into when they designed their, their plans. In some cases, they didn't look at threats, but most of the time they did. Um, we try to get a little bit into the um, stakeholder participation in the planning. And this was unfortunately not very possible because, um, and I'll report that a little bit later in, in the case study for the marine storage, um, but because this is very, um, it's not very well documented, which is another reason why the database is quite important. We couldn't go into too much detail, but we did provide some classification of how uh, stakeholders participated in the, in the planning. And then finally, we went down to documenting what um, type of planning outputs the different exercises uh, resulted in, and included things like what approaches people followed, if they did, include things like ecological connectivity, um, modifications of the designs to account for climate change, and importantly, what type of socioeconomic considerations they were um, looking into, if at all, during, during planning. So um, the, the database was, um, is, um, was introduced into a review paper that we published um, last year in biological conservation. The, essentially, the, the database um, what is described in this paper, so I would, I would recommend you to have a look if you want to more detail. Um, it's got a lot of supplementary material too, so it will allow you to get into the, the more of, of the database and, and, and the review. And it was also um, done as a way to have another go at, so where are we in terms of, uh, of marine conservation planning? Um, Heather Leslie, who is a key collaborator of the, of the database development um, and has been for a while, and did the first review of marine planning in 2005, if I remember properly. Um, so since then, so over 10 years um, um, later, what has happened in terms of marine planning? So this, um, this marine proof of concept um, provides the first full compilation of marine studies to date. And this will allow especially scientists, because it's focused on the peer review literature, but also practitioners to act and analyze further aspects of marine learning. Um, to do this review, we identify over 165 um, papers that satisfy the criteria of what is systematic conservation planning. And this roughly corresponded to about 150 plan, plans. Um, again, this, uh, we focused on the peer review literature and there were a few reasons why we did this at this stage, other than the massive task that uh, required documenting, fully documenting these 150 plans. Um, but part of it is that we wanted to be um, consistent and a lot of the great literature is obviously not, not very easily accessible. And a lot of it is in languages um, that were beyond the um, capacity of our, our group to, to handle. That's why we focus on the, on the peer review literature. So I'm going to um, present some of the results from this review um, as a way to simplify some of the applications of, of and this will give you also an idea of the type of things um, it will get you thinking about the type of things that this database can be used for. So, as I said before, uh, in general for conservation planning, but particularly for marine conservation planning, over the past 15 years, there's been an exponential increase in the number of marine plants that have been published. There's been, in, uh, it's been good to, it was good to see that there was uh, more attention given to socioeconomic considerations in particular, and to all things like landscape planning, and more recently to how to incorporate ecological connectivity and, and climate change into the plants, both of which are pretty critical um, elements of the design, uh, especially of marine protected area networks. Um, 
There's all the topics that are getting, are still gaining traction, but they're not as widespread in the literature, and that includes marine stoning, uh, planning for um, pelagic systems and processes, and, and things like um, yeah, essentially dynamic dynamic population planning. Um, while stakeholder participation, as I said before, is obviously a critical part of the of the marine pro planning, pro planning process, um, we found little evidence of input from conservation practitioners and stakeholders. And even though um, people may think that, well, obviously that, that is because you focus on the peer review literature and a lot of the peer review literature is not meant to include stakeholders, we believe that developing so a lot of these methods and the way that a lot of these papers are being framed is to actually inform future decisions, if not directly, at least through providing the methods. And if you don't have the participation of the stakeholders, or at least some of the key stakeholders, uh, managers, um, users within these planning processes, then you lose, you lose big opportunities of developing um, methods and outputs that are more usable for actual uh, implementation of conservation. Um, what was the distribution in terms of um, space of, of plants? Well, as probably expected and uh, not unsurprising, um, there were important gaps in the geographic coverage of, of the planning studies that we analyzed. So the map on the, on the right is showing the number of studies that have been led by organizations from the countries that are shaded in different tomes, with the lightest being countries with no organizations recorded as needing any of, this, of the studies that we analyzed. And in the different colors from blue to red are the number of studies that have been undertaken per marine region. That doesn't mean that the whole region has been planned for. In some cases, it is a fraction of the ecoregion. So you can see from, from that figure in itself that there's a lot of blue where it has, at least in the peer review literature that hasn't been planning. And even though expanding to the gray literature will certainly show, or we expect that it would show a, um, um, a, a bigger spread of the, of the effort, uh, we think that it is concerning that a lot of the effort in terms of the development of the research has been focusing in a small portion of the, of the marine environment across the globe. Um, and so this in itself is, is obviously important. Um, but it is especially more important when we see this in comparison to where areas are of at highest risk. Right? So what we did is we compared this then with a map of the areas that are at higher, higher risk, higher threat. If you look um, again to the map, you will see that it will transition into the map of um, cumulative impact per marine ecoregion. And so if we flip between these two maps, you can see that a lot of the areas that are in, in blue um, are in red here, and that there's a lot of um, red or in areas where there hasn't been any plan. So this, this shows at least it calls to our attention to, to some mismatch in the way the plan has happened and place where marine biodiversity might be at highest risk. So um, as I said, more than more than half of the marine regions have no planning exercises, at least in the in the primary literature. And of the regions with studies, uh, about 13% have only one exercise reported. So it really is calling um, researchers to look into these, into future research. And if there are any reasons for this bias, we, we probably should, um, should try to, to solve it and, and move forward with um, plan for research. Then another interesting thing that we analyzed uh, of this, uh, with the marine planning exercises was to try to have an understanding of where planning has occurred and where there is expertise in conservation planning. And again, we think that this is very critical for advancing marine conservation because um, of the development of capacities for, for planning. So what we found was not too surprising, but a bit surprising, was that a lot of, like 80% of the marine studies, we, we didn't think it was going to be that big, is 
traded in just five countries. And so that map on the right is showing the countries that have done planning and where they have done planning. So for example, you have the reds with Australia, you have the blues with the, sorry, the yellow with the um, USA, the orange with Canada. And then there's um, the South Africa Forum Pink. So you can see that there is a huge export of planning expertise um, across the globe and that some of these networks go far and wide, right? Um, so these um, suggest two things. One, that there is obviously some organizations in some countries or some organizations in some countries with strong resources and expertise in conservation planning, and it is important to identify who is. But also it shows that a lot of these uh, organizations or the countries um, that hold these organizations have the capacity to build capacities in other countries. The figure on the right is essentially showing a graphical representation of how the different countries, again, from, from well, how they, um, yeah, how the different countries are connected to other countries in terms of planning. Um, and so in this case, the size of the circles represent the EZ of the, of the country where the planning organization is um, hosted. Um, the colors is representing um, how healthy, I guess, the oceans are, based on the Ocean Health Index by Halpern et al. And the size of the arrows represent how many plants have happened. So you can see, you can still see, you can start to see some patterns there in terms of who plants were which areas um, different countries have are planning at the same time. For example, the Coa Triangle, somewhere between Australia and the US, um, is obviously an area of common expertise and so potentially also an area of competition if not undertaken um, appropriately. Um, and so I think at this point, I'm going to, um, before moving to the next, I'll try to, uh, tell you really quickly, and if I and if we have um, time, go through the prototype tool. But essentially, um, what is showing there? Well, that's just a quick animation of how the actual tool looks. And as you can see, the platform uh, at this point, the, the prototype allows um, users to find and conservation plans using different criteria. So you can use things like what what, what organization um, was involved in the planning. What was the geographic scope of the plan? What were the type of um, environments and features that were um, targeted? So obviously things like when the plan happened, um, the level of stakeholder participation. Uh, again, it's based on a very um, general classification at this stage. And then some, some key information that allows us to see what methods and what tools were used. And so once, once users identify a subset of the plans that uh, fulfill their criteria, then people go and can download all available information for the selected plans, right? So at this point, even though it's a relatively simple um, tool, it allows you to query and to find much more easily the the plans that have happened in a region or that have followed certain approaches or that have been undertaken um, using different type of methods or, or tools. So I'll I'll go back to the to the platform in a second. Um, just to avoid getting out of the presentation. Um, and I'll tell you what type of things we were working on um, at the moment. So, um, as you probably have been thinking along the presentation, there is obviously a lot of things that still need to be done. Um, and there's, um, even though we have big dreams about what we're expecting, um, we're trying to focus on the things that we think are potentially the most important. And for that, we've developed um, close collaboration with a number of organizations. Uh, in, uh, Imperial College London and the World Conservation Monitoring Center from um, the UN system. And the type of things that we've been 
uh, discussing with them about things that need to be done to the database to improve its functionality are allowing users to more easily enter and update their plans. This is going to be really important to, instead of having a small number of people um, entering information, um, we expand this and invite the whole community of planners to enter their own plans and to update them as they move forward, right? So some people may want to start entering their plans as they're going through and then modifying them as they, as they, as they move forward. So this is obviously a really important thing and one that's not gonna, it's not gonna require uh, a huge effort, but rather just making sure that the information is entered consistently and that there are some checks um, to make sure that the quality obviously is, is, is good. Then we're looking into some key progress indicators and if people are interested, we can talk about it a bit later at the end of the talk. Um, but we would like to have something that allow us uh, and allow governments and maybe intergovernmental organizations like the Convention on Biological Diversity to identify, okay, how well are we doing in terms of, um, of uh, progress in conservation planning? And then we could combine these things with a map interface, which um, would allow us to make not only special queries, but also comparisons of these indicators and the advances in planning with the actual implementation of it. So this is, this figure on the right is essentially, um, I guess, a summary of where we are and where we are planning to go, right? So the, the, the boxes in, in green and in yellow are the things that we already have in the, in the database. And these are the type of things that I've been describing, right? How inform general information about the case studies, where they are, what people have targeted, how they have done it, what type of things they've thought about, and then information about the, I guess, the, the tools, the case studies, and the methods, the methods used. Um, there's a few there in yellow because that we think need uh, more, inf more information and that can be further developed without getting too complicated. But these are the type of things that will require to get more input from the actual planners because a lot of the information, as I, as I said before, we did, we found that there was some, um, bar, the, that the plans were documented in, in various levels of um, detail and quality. So in many cases, it is only through the direct contribution of the actual planners, so all the implementers of the plan that we could get some of this information. And then there's completely new things like uh, related to implementation and the monitoring of impacts that there's only, the only way to get this information would be to have the direct participation of the, of the conservation um, community out there. So you can see also, there's a few suggested links to some of the existing databases that will help us want to identify plans that could be entered into the database. We could uh, form um, maybe some alliances with some of these organizations and bring some of these plans in a more expedited way. Uh, and, Obviously, a key link that we're exploring together with um, the WCMC is whether we can um, make some form of link to the, for example, the World Database of Protected Areas. And so in that case, it would allow us to make a more direct connection between the planning and the implementation of, of areas, for example. So essentially making the information more rich and more useful to, um, to know how well we're doing in, in making progress into achieving all these national, national and international targets. And so um, we, need, we need more help, right? Um, and so the, in order to achieve the, these next steps and in order to consolidate the database in, uh, in the final shape, we need help from different organizations. We need to reach the international community and ask for people to help us reach the international community to encourage the planners to include and to update their plans, for example. Um, one thing that we're going to be starting doing soon is to get in touch with the uh, uh, people from some of the key conservation journals. And there is obviously there's, the, there's, uh, this is a subset, but uh, a very important subset of the literature. And there's 
probably about like 10 journals that have like 99% of the conservation planning literatures. So if we can reach this and, and ask them to help us to um, plan it for planners to enter their plans, that would make a huge difference in terms of um, transparency in how we're doing science in, in conservation planning. We definitely have to um, look more into alliances with uh, um, IUCN, uh, particularly the World Conservation Protected area, um, Areas, and the CBD in terms of uh, the work plans and how they're looking into measuring progress. And the Society for Conservation Biology would be a really important ally in terms of identifying um, the experts and the people doing things on the ground. There's also another group of organizations. I mean, these are just um, but potentially the ones that have the largest number of conservation plans to date. So getting uh, getting these organizations engaged in the in the process is going to be also really 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 important. And some of them already have some databases, even though they differ in some way. We think that some of these databases are easily um, adaptable and linkable to to the database that we developed. So it's a matter of of working together with these organizations to um, First, refine our database and second, amalgamate um, some of these data sets. And so um, I want to finish by acknowledging, um, um, in talking as it looks, it sounds like um, JTU and just a bunch of people have done um, most of the work. And, and it's really a lot of the work of this database has been based on the huge effort of scientists and practitioners around the world. Um, whose plans have allowed us to do this um, synthesis of, of planning and the development of the database. A group of people that have uh, participated directly in the development of the database uh, structure and in the review of the marine planning literature. And so I wanted to acknowledge um, my co authors from, from the paper from these universities. Um, then there were people that were involved uh, from especially at the earlier stages uh, in the design and then in the latest stages in the development of the actual tool at James Cook University. And so also a big thank to those people. And then in this uh, stage that we're at the moment, um, we are working as, we, as I said before with the World Conservation Monitoring Center in trying to take the next steps in in the development of the, of the target. And so I just didn't want to finish the presentation without acknowledging the work of these people on this. Of course, a huge um, thank you to the network, to Sarah and Nick for extending the invitation to present and to all the other um, initiatives that are out there and that allow us to reach, that allow us to reach the wider community to to invite them to be part of this of this process. Um, so, without further ado, I'll I'll move to um, I'll finish here to allow if there are any questions. Those are my contact details anyway, and you can get in touch with me at any point, and I'm more than happy to you um, and to answer any questions. Um, please visit the database to have a look. Um, so we have time now, I might just have a quick look and quick browse, but that, that is the address of the database. And the paper, which, as I said, was published in Biological Conservation, is also available for free in Markive. Um, and so you can also access it through, through that um, repository of, of that. And without further ado, uh, I'll get back to you, Sarah. Okay. All right, Jorge, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we, we have some questions. Uh, yeah, we re Jorge, we really appreciate you giving this talk too. Uh, let's see, so I'll, I'll get started from the questions we've received. Um, in the assessment of links for countries and organizations, how did you consider international organizations who have offices in different parts of the world? Oh, uh, yes. So for that, for that um, analysis in particular, we counting the leading organization as a research institution 
that was the primary of, of the primary author, and we considered the organization that was, um, for example, if it was um, uh, TNC um, Ontario, we associated that with um, Canada. So we, we took the office or the department or the branch that was relevant to the planning exercise. If in some cases it was WWF um, global office, and in that case we associated with the place it's located, which in this case was um, the US. Initially we took the organization that was the branch that was leading the planning exercise that was relevant to the to the plan. This doesn't mean that that was a um, uh, leading organization, uh, but based on the information that we could gather directly from the plans without extensive consulting with the planners, that was the best approximation to to mapping those things. Okay, great. Okay, thank you, Jorge. Um, another question, monitoring effectiveness of design plans in terms of mitigation of impacts on biodiversity is essential to inform planners in what approach should be undertaken. Did you find any information on this topic in your peer review? Yeah, so unfortunately the information about this is really, really thin uh, in the peer review literature. I mean, there's, I can almost, um, we can almost count them with a couple of hands. There is some information about this and some of these are included in, when, when this information was available, it is included in a very generic way in the description of the, of the outputs. Um, I mean, some examples that I can think from the top of my head are things like the design of the, some of the California protected area networks. The grid, I believe there's a few in South Africa, there's other examples from the Coral Triangle. Um, there's a couple of examples from Fiji, the Gulf of California. So there are some examples, um, fortunately because because of our sample is, um, uh, well, sorry, our data set was focused on the peer review literature. A lot of this information is not um, very well documented. And a lot of the plans that were documented, they just focus mostly on the technical aspects of the planning. And that's why this new additional information, which we think is really, really critical, will have to be further developed and will have to with input directly from people involved in the planning or, or directly with the implementation of this conservation intervention. But I agree it's a, it's a critical and for us is probably one of the most important developments to um, be done okay. with the database. Yeah. All right, thank you, Harkin. Um, and there's a, a question. It could be interesting to, or well, it's actually more of a comment. It could be interesting mm -hmm. to compare the evolution, if available, of the cumulative impact index by ecoregion you showed with the number of conservation plans implemented in each ecoregion. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we could, we could even try to have a go at it with the sample we have, even though we have a pretty good number, um, because the number of plants per ecoregion were relatively um, all, if you remember the map, even in the, one, even in the regions where there was a lot of planning. But yeah, yeah certainly. And, and this analysis will be really interesting if we, when we incorporate the, the, the marine plan, the, sorry, the great literature and the terrestrial environment has a much bigger um, size in terms of number of plants. So this analysis would be extremely, really interesting also to, to do. I agree. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, is, that would be a great in, uh, area to pursue from the comment. Uh, so let's see, another question. There seems to be an increasing interest and in efforts to develop libraries for evidence-based conservation. Do you see any opportunity to link this work to such efforts so that practitioners can apply findings in practice? Um, yes, um, so something that I didn't mention, um, but I, um, or yeah, because I just mentioned the groups, but so a few of the people that have been involved in this process are people who have been involved in um, the work on improving evidence base in conservation interventions. So a lot of 
So when we, as we were developing the database, we cross-checked um, our structure and the structure of, of, of people working on conservation planning um, effectiveness. And um, you probably, you may have seen a, a, a recent review by Emma McIntosh and collaborators on the impact of conservation and uh, which unfortunately found um, that there were not that many plans that you could systematically assess or um, with enough evidence in terms of the impact from directly from planning, which, which also emphasizes how difficult it is to, to do these things and how much more work we need to, we need to do that. But um, I guess to answer more in a, in a short way, um, I agree with, we need to work very closely with, with these initiatives and with people developing the methods to ensure that the way we're documenting things help, helps us to um, properly document the evidence of how planning has informed um, actual implementation. Okay, great, thank you, Jorge. And there was a comment that came in. Um, I have a similar question comment. I'm currently working with conservation evidence uh, in Cambridge and the two projects could be complementary. So uh, we'll, we'll provide that information to you. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. Great. Yeah, I was going to suggest if, if people can um, send suggestions or um, get in touch with us for specific things, that would, that would be great. Okay. Well, great. And so we don't have any more questions at this time, but uh, you did a great job laying out uh, the current status for the conservation planning database and next, next steps. And I hope you got, um, I hope you got lots of contacts offline. Um, it was certainly our pleasure to uh, help let's spread the word about this great initiative, Jorge. So um, uh, we wish you the best of luck and thank you everyone who was able to participate today. I'm sorry the sound was a little choppy, but um, I think uh, it, was, it was understandable. And um, we'll have a recording if anyone uh, wants to see it. And then uh, I'd encourage you to contact Jorge for any additional information. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much um, again, Sarah, for the opportunity. Um, and thanks everyone for for being here. Um, perhaps the only additional thing that I just wanted to mention um, before closing was that we're going to be launching a survey about the potential uses of the database. And so just um, keep an eye on, on that. Um, that's going to help us to improve the future of the, of the tool. Okay, fantastic. And I'll share that one with you. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. All right, thank you everyone. And thank you, Jorge. Wonderful. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. So early to do this. <laughs> okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.